Hi, welcome to this edition of 21 Wired Live. Uh, we're on the live stream right now. We're streaming out on YouTube, on Periscope, and also on Facebook Live as well. And we've got a very special guest uh, for you today. Uh, I'm going to be joined by a writer and also the editor at Land Destroyer uh, Blogspot. He's been a, a guest uh, on 21 Wired Live uh, before and uh, formerly wrote under the uh, very well-known nom de plume of Tony Cardellucci. He's joining me on the live link uh, right now, and his name is Brian Berletic. Uh, hello, Brian. How are you doing? Hello. Uh, thank you for having me again. Thanks. Uh, and I want to point people to a featured article uh, up at uh, 21st Century uh, Wired.com. This is uh, Brian's latest feature. It's a report uh, and it's entitled New U.S. President, Same Old Foreign Policy. So firstly, we'll get started, uh, Brian. What do you mean, same old foreign policy? Are you saying that nothing is going to change uh, between these two administrations? Because a lot of people are expecting sea changes in policy. I would say no, nothing is going to change. I've been writing versions of this article for years, pretty much every election. And every time someone new comes into office, whether it's in, in Congress or in the White House, and everybody is saying, well, you know, this time everything is going to change. They're going to listen to the voters this time and nothing changes. At first, the rhetoric changes and then there's new uh, excuses that are invented as to why things are not changing. And then toward, you know, like toward the end of Obama's administration, you know, he was just all out, you know, doing all of these wars, expanding everything uh, and then handing what would look like a mess to Trump. And they do this very deliberately, like right at the end, they do all of these last minute things to make it look like, well, the next guy just had it handed to him. And there's really nothing he could do about it, especially for Trump, just four years. He didn't have any, you know, didn't have any time to undo all of this. And they just do this from one administration to the next. And so this one is just the latest version of this this type of article, this type of warning that I try to give people that no, nothing is going to change. And as a matter of fact, if people listen to the hearing that uh, Joe Biden's new Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, if they if they watch that hearing and listen to his answers to the senators, he he's he's promising you that nothing is going to change. He's telling you. I'm going to, you know, we're going to keep troops in Afghanistan. We're going to continue uh, escalating tensions with China and Russia and even our allies. You know, all of the things, all the indiscretions, you know, that we, we blamed on Trump are actually going to continue that as well. He, he, he basically promised it right on, you know, live on C-SPAN for everyone to see. Uh, unfortunately, people don't watch that. They they look at the headlines, you know, uh, the headlines and the rhetoric and wishful thinking, too, I think, is, is the reason why people will, will continue holding their breath. Did, did you happen to catch uh, when Lindsey Graham, uh, the Republican senator from South Carolina, uh, an ardent ally of Trump or he be, he became an ally of Trump? He wasn't initially. He was in the never Trump camp. Uh, but. Uh, and a very close colleague of John McCain over the years. So that'll give you some indication of where Lindsey Graham's uh, foreign policy proclivities lie, uh, namely pro-war and very hawkish on just about everybody uh, on the planet that you could be hawkish against. But it, it was almost like there was a love affair uh, between him and Anthony Blinken. I mean, Lindsey just perked up. It was as if he had found a long lost soul uh, across the room there. Uh, Blinken was really singing the songs that uh, Lindsey Graham and other uh, neocons uh, very much approved of. And this is a Democratic uh, selection here, supposedly a liberal uh, left-wing president uh, appointing his cabinet. And here we have him seeing completely eye-to-eye. -eye. It was almost like a Vulcan mind melt, Brian. <laughs> so I couldn't believe it. Um, I'm I'm laughing now, but when I when I was watching it, my, my blood was boiling. Actually, through through I, I only could stomach... Um, Graham, Cruz, and Rubio, and then I had to stop because it was just, it was just nauseating. I mean, honestly, uh, we're talking about policy that when it actually unfolds, uh, 
this, this will be continuing to destroy lives all all around the globe. But uh, yes, absolutely. I I saw that. I picked up on that. And uh, the other thing is, you mentioned earlier that uh, Trump being a one term president, uh, you know, the likelihood of any any U.S. president in one term to fundamentally alter the trajectory of any particular, you know, long term mainstay U.S. foreign policy or geopolitical position, aim or objective, very unlikely to do in four years. Now, I, I don't do hypotheticals, Brian, but I think in this case we could do a hypothetical. If Trump won re-election, uh, did you see some substantive changes in direction, uh, namely reducing troop levels and commitments in places like Iraq, trying to get out of Syria, of course, attacked by Graham and others uh, when he attempted to announce that, uh, and maybe detente with North Korea, for instance, uh, you know, do, do you think as a two term president, uh, he would have had a chance or would he have been pulled back so hard by the undertow of deep uh, interests and the kind of financial and corporate interests, which you outlined very well uh, in this article at 21st Century Wire? So it's it's those interests precisely why, you know, nothing was going to change under Trump in, in four years or eight years. And when we're looking at troop reductions and we're looking at, you know, the, the U.S. kind of, I wouldn't say stepping away from, from Syria, but, you know, kind of scaling back their ambitions, I think this was all pr pragmatic. This, the, this was on the ground. The situation dictated that this was the only thing that they could do, because let's just say in, in Syria, with Russia there and with Iran you know, helping the Syrian government. What was the U.S. going to do? What was their plan at that point? I would say once Russia intervened, that basically was the end of, of the U.S. adventure in Syria, the U.S. regime change agenda in Syria. And I think once Russia intervened, there were some instances where the U.S. thought maybe it could, it could bluff like they did in Serbia. There were, there were a couple of instances where the U.S. bluffed Russia and, and Russia blinked and left, uh, would, would, would withdraw from certain areas. They tried to do that to Russia in Syria and it didn't work because this is a different period of time. And, and the age of American hegemony over the planet is, is clearly coming to an end. So when, when people try to attribute these things to Trump, I would say probably had very little to do with, I think if he wanted to do it and the establishment didn't want to do it, I think things would have been many times more vicious than what we saw. A lot of what we saw, I think, I, I'm just maybe, you know, we, we, we don't sit in on the tables when, when these things are being decided, but a lot of it seems like theater just to distract the public, to, to make excuses as to why the U.S. is leaving. Oh, we wanted to stay there, but, you know, Trump, he, he wanted us out, and that's why. Uh, but let's see, you know, now, now that Biden is there, you know, did did China or Russia have have their capabilities decreased over the last four years or increased? What what is the U.S. plan to reassert itself in these places? You know, Trump withdrew from. So you know that's that's what I would say. That's that's interesting argument because what you're saying is uh, although there are certain maneuvers uh, that can be done politically. Uh, in, in the domestic political setting uh, to alter policy slightly. Uh, there's really sort of physical realities. There's geopolitical realities that are already taking shape. Uh, and, and also, you could argue uh, as well that, let's take Syria, for instance, as a good example. Uh, the, the U.S. and its allies, what they did in putting that situation into motion in, in 2011 um, that you know that very move by the U.S. itself created uh, a type of a blowback for them uh, because it did force countries like Russia to make very strong commitments outside of their borders to basically uh, stand shoulder to shoulder with Damascus, for instance, and also it, alarm bells went off in Tehran as well, uh, and the Iranians got very deeply involved in that conflict. If if that proxy war had not been waged by the Obama administration with such ferocity and so many billions in terms of weapons that were trafficked 
via Turkey. These are NATO allies we're talking about as well, and Jordan uh, on the south as well, and Israel as well, more covertly though, not officially kind of off the books uh, involved in that. Um, if that didn't happen, of course, then you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation, would we, about Trump withdrawing troops, quote, from from Syria. So that's a, that's a, an interesting point. And I think when you start arguing like that, Brian, and I'll, I'll let you speak to this point, um, you're really getting into a deeper meta-analysis of, of foreign policy than just a reactionary uh, a cycle of uh, situations, which I think the media and the mainstream and, and quite frankly, mainstream politics, they prefer that reactionary cycle uh, where they just seem to be reacting from point to point without any real reflection of, of how and why, uh, you know, they could, and, or even considering whether that might not have been a, a very good decision to make in 2011. But uh, go ahead. Uh, as I always try to point out, especially when, when talking about uh, a crisis like in Syria, I try to point out to people that that didn't just pop up in 2011. That wasn't just some, you know, people coming out into the streets and the U.S. opportunistically seizing on that, that moment to, to get involved. The regime change in Syria has been a project of the U.S. for, for decades since uh, President Bashar al-Assad's father was president, they have been using militants as proxies to try to overthrow the government in Syria. And this was just the latest iteration of, of this plan. And it, you know, I think it got a lot further than it had in the past. But then I think also at the same time, it's showing a lot of the vulnerabilities of the US and, and the US empire, if you want to call it that, uh, that they have serious limitations, that countries like Russia that, that years ago would not be able to assert themselves, would not be able to pull off the, the military operation that was their intervention in Syria. They're able to do that now. And, and like I said, over the last four years, those capabilities have only grown. They haven't, they haven't diminished. And, and for the U.S., their ability to intervene with impunity around the globe is increasingly under pressure by countries like Russia by countries like China, who are, who are developing these capabilities. And in a lot of cases, they're developing these capabilities specifically in response to the threat the U.S. itself poses. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of a vicious cycle. The harder the U.S. tries to grip onto this, this fading empire of, its, of it, uh, you know, the more nations around the world are reacting to it, creating the, the defenses that they need to push the U.S. out of their corner of the world. Um, well, you want, uh, maybe because I, I have other, I would like to go into to China, but, uh, let's, let's just, uh, stop it, stop there for a moment. Well, let, let's, let's go into China actually, because the Pacific Rim, uh, certainly that's something that's, uh, been elevated, uh, in terms of, you know, the U S consciousness, but I mean, we've always known post-World War II, uh, that, you know, the U S has a certain, deterrent position that's traditional, the occupation of Okinawa, you've got Guam, you've got South Korea, uh, you've got all of these positions that have basically encircled um, China effectively now in the 21st century that, that were there as a kind of um, the, the, the sort of agreement similar to the U.S. occupation of Germany uh, post-World War II uh, in to, you know, to provide the, quote, collective defense for the Japanese and the Germans so that they don't raise uh, a military in a nationalist sense. Uh, and then they're, in return, they get free access to the U.S. markets, could build up their economy post-World War II. Uh, but, you know, so we're still there in that deterrent position. Um, but in the meantime, have gradually, gradually sort of created an arc uh, around China and not just on the Pacific side, uh, Brian, but also uh, around the southern uh, part of that arc. Uh, and, and of course, Central Asia, Afghanistan, and then moving on. So um, we always talk about encirclement of Russia as a as a big, you know, uh, provocation, if you will, uh, by the U.S. and NATO. But Really, if you look at the, the, the whole global map, it's, uh, it's an encirclement of China in many respects. And of course, you being in Southeast Asia, you're very well positioned. Uh, you've got a very good vantage point on both directions of this, uh, this situation. But yeah, go ahead. So this is another 
this is another area where a lot of people think, oh, um, especially with Obama and his rollout of the, the pivot to Asia, people were like, oh, this is a new, this is a new strategy. This is um, something fresh that, you know, the U.S. is going to, you know, walk away from its, its vicious wars in the Middle East and focus more attention on Southeast Asia, basically, and, and building up alliances there that they claim were neglected. In reality, these are alliances that the, the, the people and even the governments here in the region don't want. They never wanted. Uh, and they, they have reluctantly, you know, countries that have been allied with the U.S. in the past, like during the Vietnam War, this was reluctant because they were watching what the U.S. was doing to Vietnam. And they were thinking, we, you know, we could accommodate them or we could end up the next one in line. Uh, but, but what I want to point out is the policy papers. You know the think tanks that that we're we're probably going to talk about a little later. These policy papers span decades. So you know, let's go back to the Pentagon Papers, which were were leaked in the 1970s. And there's one memorandum from 1965 in in those papers where they're talking about how the Vietnam War was part one part of a much wider agenda of encircling and containing China. And they talk about you know how they have different fronts that they're working on to contain China, uh, Japan and Korea, uh, Southeast Asia, India and Pakistan. And we can see how from, from 1965 all the way to any uh, policy paper that you read today, how that has been a singular agenda of the United States, regardless of who was in Congress and regardless of who was in the White House. Uh, and and, uh, and we, could, we could spot check in between uh, then and now, we could look at the, the project for a new American century and their rebuilding America's defense paper from the year 2000. And all they talk about is needing to contain China, needing to integrate China into the US unipolar order and how the US needs to find excuses to, to build a military presence in Southeast Asia. And that's when we saw a lot of these militant groups popping up, um, you know, so-called Muslim extremists, but these were, this was political, this was not re religious, and we saw them pop up, and we've seen the U.S. use many excuses to try to insert itself militarily in the region. The, the Obama pivot to, to Asia, announced by U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton at the time, uh, that was all about finding some sort of reason for the U.S. to insert itself militarily in the region permanently. And the South China Sea, uh, disputes. These are these are actually regular disputes that all the countries in this region have with each other, not not just what, between them and China, but even amongst each other. Uh, and the U.S. is trying to transform that into a, into a crisis, a regional and international crisis. And we can look at a, a 2015 paper from the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, revisiting U.S. grand strategy toward China. And, and again, they're saying we failed to integrate China. So what do we do next? So you can see how it's the same goal, but they're, they're trying different things because nothing is working and, Ch and China just keeps rising and the US keeps getting pushed out of the region. So when we talk about continuity of agenda, uh, this is the perfect example. It's something that started back in the 60s or even before that and continues to this day. And you could pick any paper and if you didn't look at the date, you wouldn't know if you were reading a recent policy paper or, or one from decades ago. So I think people should get into a habit of, of at least checking into some of these. It's, uh, it's hard reading, but when you look at this, you, you realize how hopeless it is to, to go and vote for, for representatives in Washington. They, they represent somebody, but not, not the voters. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, it would, it would require some epic you know, a radical break, uh, maybe a, a populist uprising of, of some description that would transform uh, American politics, not just politics, but culture uh, as well. Uh, because also the media is a big part of this uh, as well. Now, if you're just joining us on the live stream, I'm here with Brian Berletic. Uh, he is also editor of Land Destroyer, also a special contributor at 21stCenturyWire.com. We're talking about his new feature, 
article, which is up on our website right now, pinned on the features section, report new U.S. president, same old foreign policy. Uh, and so Brian's making the argument that there is a long-term continuity that's just almost baked in to uh, the Washington uh, machine that really transcends administrations, even that, that they might appear to be radically different on the surface. And uh, earlier, Brian, you were talking about uh, the think tanks uh, and the role that they play and these papers, which you've just cited uh, very well, and the role that they play in making this happen. And uh, if you look up on screen right now, uh, I've done a, a sort of a basic presentation. I, re I read your article, Brian, and I got an idea. Of, so let's try to visualize uh, what you're talking about in this great piece. I mean, you explain it really well uh, in print, in words. And I've done a little animation here uh, to try to see how this works uh, in terms of visually. But I'm going to call this the foreign policy machine, uh, just for argument's sake. And so we start with, according to what you've described here, I've got transnational corporations and big finance. So we'll start there because this this is where I think everything starts. People want to know, Brian, where does UN for, U.S. foreign policy begin? And uh, would you agree that this might be a good a good place to start? Yes, it's it's absolutely exactly where to start. I mean, th there's this old saying, "Money is power," and so the people who have the most money have ha obviously have the most power, and these corporations. I try to explain to people that uh, the corporations in the U.S., they are the largest, most powerful, wealthiest businesses on earth in human history. Uh, this is something people have to understand that this is where real power comes from. It's not, it doesn't come from a, a political party or a platform or an idea. It comes from having money and having people under you that can do things, physical things, tangible changes in the world for you when you tell them to and no, nothing embodies that better than these gigantic corporations i mean just think of boeing or lockheed or raytheon these are companies that physically make things that that can kill people and they make tons of money doing it and they have a lot of influence with that money they own things like factories these these are not people that just have ideas these are people who have the means to make anything happen that they want uh and you look at uh, the banks, the oil companies, it's all very similar. They, they, they have, they're in different industries, uh, but they have, it's the same concept where they have money, they have power, they have people under them. Uh, they don't get elected to terms. There's no four-year term for, for the boards of directors and the shareholders. These are people that transcend politics. They transcend one administration to the next. And that's why policy never changes because what Boeing wanted 50 years ago is what they want today. They want more money. They want more power. They want to eliminate their competitors wherever they are in America or abroad. And that's what they're going to do. And that's what they're going to pay the people in Washington to do for them. Yes. And, and in the form of lobbying, uh, contribu campaign contributions, and there's other kinds of influence. And we'll, we'll see how the transnational corporations encircle really uh, the country culturally, politically, in this process, which which I'll show here, I'll add Big Agra as well, uh, GMO, uh, agricultural industrial complex, chemical industrial complex, um, all these major industries that are really transnational and big finance. And I didn't say Wall Street, Brian, because really uh, the City of London, uh, the the main uh, central banks uh, and private investment banks uh, in Europe as well work very much hand in hand. With, with Wall Street on this. So their business is ubiquitous across borders. So uh, this green box here on screen that doesn't recognize any national borders per se, it recognizes uh, a global capital and finance. Uh, and so, uh, so we have an arrow going there and that's going to be money going to think tanks. And these are think tanks like, uh, I'll give you some examples. You might add a few names here as well. The Brookings Institute. Uh, the American Enterprise Institute, uh, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, can you add a, a few good names to that list, uh, Brian? I would say the Rand Corporation, Atlantic Council is, is a really extremely toxic one. Um, actually, I mean, if you, if you list them all off, there's, there's so many of them. But essentially, 
the thing I always tell people to do is to, to follow the money. Go to their websites and look so that that arrow with the money, it goes all the way back to the, that green box for every single one of them. There, you, you will see the same companies funding each and every one of them. And, and the reason why is because these think tanks span you know, the whole spectrum of, of you know, political left and right. They also uh, specialize in, in different areas, domestic policy, foreign policy, foreign policy by region. And these corporations are interested in influencing all of that. So that's why they're giving money to, to such a wide variety of think tanks. It's also, uh, I think the, the last time we were talking, we talked about like a, a game board and making sure all your pieces are on the board and your opponent has no pieces on the board. So if all of the think tanks and, and all of academia and everything is all filled up by these transnational corporations, uh, there's no room left for, for anyone else to be represented, to, to play the game, basically. So it's, it's about dominating that game board, which is the global marketplace, uh, which we'll show you in a minute there. And so the, the next stage of this, so the money goes from the transnational corporations, big finance, plowed into think tanks that pays for fellows visiting fellows uh journalists uh people from previous administrations that are out of power and then they they can kind of park and still get uh, income in some of these uh these various think tanks uh the foreign policy initiative is another one i, I might add that's a that was the rebrand of the project of the new american century robert kagan and others i believe he's the husband of victoria newland who's uh back in the Obama administration. Uh, and so these these think tanks, and by the way, I, I might add, with think tanks, these really came into their own, I think, uh, from the 1960s uh, and really into the 1970s and 80s. And one of the reasons, at least on the conservative think tank side, uh, there was kind of a, a an institutional purge of conservative or right-wing or Republican-type people in American academia. And so the, the corporations, you know, saw, saw this trend and they said, we need to sort of build our own parallel, uh, intellectual, uh, institutions, uh, in order to keep our ideas alive and to really do what we're talking about here to keep this cycle alive. And so they, and, and you know, in terms of conservative philosophy, uh, the Cato Institute economics, there's a lot of people that can support, uh, some of these ideas, free market economics, in in more of a libertarian sense uh, rather than a crony capital sense. But in terms of foreign policy, this absolutely is what happened, and this is it, it's created a whole industry, a, a thought quote industry, and these also morphed into neoliberal think tanks. And so that's when you see the the policies coming together between Democrats and Republicans, and especially under the the Biden administration. So I, from the think tanks, Brian, we get ideas, we get faces. These are pundits. These are uh, visiting fellows. Uh, these are corporate officers, political staffers. And, and so they're pushing policies, policy ideas, content as well. They're producing content uh, for the mainstream media, in a sense, writing articles, op-eds, Washington Post. There's plenty of these people that are pushing their ideas out. And so that's right into the mainstream media. We'll call it big media. So from transnational corporations, money into think tanks, from the think tanks, that money is uh, tra transformed into ideas, faces, policies, content, which is fed into the mainstream media. And then on from there, that helps to form the ecosystem of ideas. And that's the Washington consensus. So that Washington consensus is formulated across mainstream media across the think tank sphere. Uh, and, and again, as you said originally, Brian, it reflects the interests of that first box, the green box, transnational corporations and big finance. Do you, do you want to add anything to this stage of the, of the diagram? Yeah, I, well, this, um, this big media and the, the ideas, spaces, policies and content that, that is so important to point out. And, and once, you know, once uh, we, we say this to your audience and people see this and start looking for it, it's going to drive them crazy. When you watch the, the mainstream media, when you watch the corporate media, you are going to notice that almost everyone that they have on is someone from one of these think tanks. You're, you're going to notice it now, now that it's been pointed out. 
Brookings Institution, CFR, um, Atlantic Council, all of these you know, experts, they all come from these corporate funded think tanks. It's, it's one self-referencing loop. That's what the media is. They have these people on so that the, the media doesn't just say it themselves, so that they have someone that, that ordinary people don't have time to look into all of this, uh, to look, oh, who is that guy? What is the, the Brookings Institution? They, they don't have time to do that. They just, oh, he looks like an expert. He looks, he looks like he knows what he's talking about. And he's saying the thing that the guy on the other network said also, who's probably also from the Brookings Institution. And this is how, this is how they do generate uh, that consensus that you were just talking about, and also how they manage public perception. This is how you know, the corporations are doing this. They're getting it rubber stamped in Washington, which will, you know, will be you know, on the next part of the chart. Um, but they need to explain to the people why this is happening and why they should uh, accept this as something they want to happen. Because actually, you know, a, a democracy or a republic or or any form of government should really it should be being driven by what what people want, shouldn't it? If that's what we think, you know, ordinary people think that. And you know, where did this idea come from? It didn't come from from me. It didn't come from you. It didn't come from from other ordinary people. Uh, so where are these ideas coming from? So this is a process of, of, of basically laundering these ideas through the media to, to get the public on board with it, to make it feel like, oh, it's their idea. And a lot of the partisan politics that we see in the U.S. Uh, is, is, a, is kind of a game to get the, the left to say something so that the, the right automatically goes against it and vice versa. And this is how they can cement policies into place because they're against it, so I want to be for it. So now it's my policy and never even thought about where it came from and whose interests it's actually serving. A lot of this, a lot of this goes on. A lot of people, I don't want to be identified as being leftist. So I'm going to be pro this, whatever this war is that's being sold. Uh, it's unfortunate, it's, but it's, it's true that, that you know, people that don't have the time to look into this are, are easily uh, gamed by it, basically. That reminds me of the, uh, I think it was the old Groucho Marx song, whatever it is, I'm against it. So back in the day, yes. but uh, that, that's a good point you brought up. Uh, where do these ideas come from? You know, where does the Washington consensus come from? Uh, does it come from the voters? Is it, is the electorate being rewarded with uh, this, the policies which they themselves want? Now, this is important because uh, there is a, a very real anti-war vein which uh, is very visible in, in, in the United States historically and has driven election results time and time again. Uh, just in recent history, George W. Bush, the war hawk, the neocon, ran on a platform against Al Gore in 2000 of no nation building. Uh, and that was a direct reaction to the disaster of the Bill Clinton presidency uh coming you know fresh off the bombing of yugoslavia and that debacle and all the other uh and, and quite frankly the the clinton administration uh did horrible things to iraq uh during that intermittent period after the first gulf war before the second gulf war um, so what does that tell you that tells you that even those who voted for george w bush uh were really casting an anti-war non-interventionist vote that was the edge that you know put him in a position to uh, uh, barely uh, beat Al Gore in that sense. Barack Obama comes along, 2008. What's his platform? It's non-intervention. It's anti-war. Who wins in a landslide? It's Barack Obama. Uh, 2012, that's a bit dicey. We'll leave that off to the side. Uh, but that's when the Obama interventionist foreign policy really ramped up uh, in 2011. And then in, what happens in 2016, Donald Trump uh, makes himself a, quote, transformational candidate, sets him apart from 16 Republican competitors, defeats all of them in the primaries, which to me was a bigger feat even than the general election, uh, which he won by the slimmest of margins against Hillary Clinton. But what did he run on? Non-intervention, almost an anti-war platform. What does that tell you about the American voter? And what now? What do we have, Brian? We have a disconnect between what the people want and what the Washington consensus, which is also the mainstream media consensus, is. But uh, a quick comment on on that phenomenon. 
Yes, uh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, American people are, are a lot of people. I tr always try to explain to people that I'm not anti-American. I I'm an American uh, by family and friends back home in America. They're all American. Uh, and I could tell you that most Americans that I meet are not OK with any of this. And so, so that's the thing. You know, why does this keep happening anyway? Why do we keep voting in people who are anti-war? I remember, I think it was in 2006, there was um, you know, a run for in Congress, and Nancy Pelosi was promising to, to stop the war in Iraq by cutting the funding. And did she ever do that? People all voted specifically for that reason, uh, and she never did. And so that's what it is. It's a bait and a switch. It's, um, it's constant rhetoric, left and right, and excuses. Uh, because they know that this is not what American people want, but it's going to happen and they need to figure out a way to get people to go along with it. And I, I, I think, you know, what we see, how, how crazy things are getting in the U.S. right now is part because the empire is kind of fading and crumbling, but also part because, you know, they're running out of tricks and excuses and, and things are moving so much faster now because of technology they're they're having a hard time explaining why everyone wants it to be this way, and yet it's still gonna be that way. So I, I, that disconnect is is coming back to haunt them now. It was manageable for the longest time with partisan politics, but is it still manageable? I, I would say looking in in the streets of America and and listening to what people are saying and thinking these days, I would say it's it's becoming untenable. And we'll just uh, a, a look a look back to our uh, our foreign policy machine uh, here, and so the we've got the Washington consensus that's now been formed, uh, and so that's meant to lead to uh, U.S. policy de facto. Once the Washington consensus is established, when we say Washington consensus, we're being very uh, explicit here, Brian. That's not the consensus of the American people. That's the consensus of Washington think tanks, transnational corporations, and the mainstream corporate media. Okay, now that would lead to, in theory, in theory, this leads to stable markets. And when I say stable markets, which what we're saying, Brian, is markets that are stable for transnational corporations and big finance. They're able to uh, invest with some degree of certainty. Uh, they know markets will be opening up. They know there will be new government coming into the Ukraine. They'll know to put their money into uh, liquefied natural gas plants in Georgia or something like this because, because of what the United States is doing foreign policy-wise. So people like George Soros, who you know very well in, in, your, in your research uh, into color revolutions and NGOs globally, you know that George Soros is a speculative investor. Uh, so what better way to know where to put your money than to actually be involved in engineering the outcomes on the ground? So he's really doing in a private capacity, uh, which would be a part parcel of United States geopolitical engineering and interventionist efforts. But he's also doing that in a private capacity, possibly for his own self-interest, uh, for his own investments as well, seeing things move in a direction. So that's market stability. And so what does that mean in terms of outcome? Well, it means this. It means more money is now going back into that green box. And that's where we started, Brian, at the beginning, transnational corporations uh, and big finance. And then we'll pull a fast maneuver here, and uh, they can sort of uh, jumpstart, kind of juice this situation by pumping money directly into Mainstream media via advertising, as an example, okay? Uh, and that helps to sort of juice this foreign policy machine. And so th that's kind of how I envision. This is a basic outline of a process. It's a lot more detailed than this, as you explain uh, in your piece, uh, Brian. But uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you uh, on this, this last stage. I just think it's interesting. Uh, again, I know it's a cliche, follow the money, uh, and it is a little more complicated than that. It's, it's not just money, it's power and influence. Um, but it's really important for people to know uh, how, not just how these ideas become consensus, but why they become consensus. But go ahead, Brian. 
Well, first of all, this is, I think this is a great diagram. So I, I think you did a good job on it. And I think it really does illustrate exactly how it works. And then I might say, uh, explain to some people that uh, the people in Washington, you know, in Congress or in the White House, there, there should be like a little rubber stamp, you know, somewhere in that maybe around near U.S. policy and Washington consensus, because that's what they do in Washington. They rubber stamp things. And in the article, I actually uh, included, uh, I included a place where I explain how many times people in Congress don't even read the bills that they get. They're not the ones writing them. They don't read them. Sometimes they have staff that read them, but most of the time it's people from, from the think tanks, from, from that blue box. They're the ones that created the policy in the first place. They're basically just putting it on their desk and telling them to sign it. And uh, you mentioned about campaign financing. I mean, these are the companies that are going to pay for their reelection. So they're putting something on their desk and telling them to sign it. Uh, it, it's, it, it really is that, it seems simplistic, but it really is that simple. That is how it works. And until the people in America or, or people around the globe impacted by this, this vicious cycle, until they can figure out a way to exert more influence on this cycle, then it's never going to change. And the change we do see happening is because like China has companies that are starting to get pretty big in size to, to the ones in that green box. Uh, countries like Russia have financial, economic, and military power that is growing, that, that can provide a check and balance to, to the abuse that comes out of this cycle. And so that's why we're actually seeing changes. And for, for people in America that want to change, they need to start thinking like that. They need to think, we got to stop. First of all, we have to stop putting our money into the green box. You know, th 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 those are companies that make products that Americans buy every day. They're, what percentage of their paycheck is, is going to those goods and services? They're feeding this cycle every time they do that. So they can vote all they want. They can go out and protest as hard as they want. They can burn every, every block down between where they live and Washington and even burn Washington down. It will make no difference as long as they're still paying into that green box. Until, until American people can come up with alternatives, local businesses, uh, a distribution of, of power and wealth through, through local entrepreneurship, uh, this is never going to change. And in, in countries that have a better balance of power, it's precisely because of that. It's because people are more uh, inclined to start their own businesses. You know, the, the, you know, the government in, in America reaches into everything with regulations and taxes, makes it almost impossible to do it. But in other countries where it's more permissible, that's why there is a balance of power. That's why you don't see cycles this vicious in other places. So it's just something for people to think about instead of instead of holding your breath or wait, waiting for Biden to change something or waiting four years for another election, uh, I, which is the definition of insanity, isn't it? To, to just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting it to, to change. You know, next time will be the time. It's not. It's, it will not. This cycle is real. Uh, you could see evidence of it everywhere you look. Uh, just, like I said, the next time you flip on the corporate media, look at who those experts are. Are they from some corporate funded think tank? Uh, oh, and one other thing I wanted to point out, you have the, the, the money going to, from, from transnational corporations to big media. Some of those big media corporations have uh, people sitting on their boards of directors who also sit on the board of directors of those transnational corporations. So it's, yeah. uh, I, I, I compare it to that scene in, in The Godfather where Mike Corleone is talking about how they could smooth over the, the political ramifications of, of killing the, the corrupt cop. And he's, he's asking Tom, uh, we got people on the payroll in the news, don't we? And they would like a story like that. Well, this is not the mafia with news people on the payroll. This is the mafia is on the board of directors of the newspaper, just running it directly, telling them what to write directly. This is why it's so unified to the point where people think that is actually reality because, because it's that well integrated and well oiled. No, absolutely. The, I mean, the defense industry, there's a number of, uh, there's overlap uh, between the boards of the major conglomerates that own 90% of U.S. media, companies like Raytheon, companies like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, uh, General Dynamics, uh, General Electric, all of these big 
uh, defense contractors sitting uh, also on the boards of major uh, media conglomerates as well, and also the major pharmaceutical companies as well. There's overlap between Pfizer and Reuters, uh, for instance, if you go and compare the uh, the names on the boards, or at least the Reuter, uh, Reuters tr Foundation, I believe as well. And you see these obviously, uh, it looks like corporate marketing uh, coming out on the major <laughs> newswire services half the time, yes. uh, which you also uh, alluded to in your previous uh feature which you did uh, last month at 21st Century Wire about the pandemic uh, industrial complex. But back to the, the the central point I think is is really important when people are watching uh, mainstream media and they're, and they're also looking at politicians. They're looking at uh, what's the what the, what are the media saying and at the same time looking at uh, what congressmen and what senators are saying. Now there are a few people in Congress and in Senate in the Senate, US Senate that I I think I, I can tell I know uh, that they are, they have studied history. They do have their own belief sets uh, in terms of worldview, uh, in terms of international relations, in terms of geopolitics, the role of the military, etc. Now, that's a minority, Brian. Okay, uh, most of them they get their positions, their ideas, based on confidence, uh, and that usually comes from their staffers or the people in their sort of immediate circle whoever they are. And so they get, com how do they get confidence? Well, if Fox is saying it, or if CNN is saying it, and MS if it's being echoed across the media landscape, uh, then obviously that's giving them confidence. There's some credibility to their position. So when they go to vote on this measure or the other, uh, they, they, they're not seen to be outliers. In other words, they're with, uh, they're part of that Washington consensus. But where do they actually get their these ideas on foreign policy. I, 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 I will say, you might agree with me or not, I would say nine out of 10 get all of their foreign policy views and nuances, the contents of their speeches, et cetera, come from think tanks. They come directly from think tanks. Uh, and, and so they're, they're not their ideas. They're not, they're not beliefs that they have got by traveling the world and doing on the ground fact finding missions uh, and, and having a deep understanding and insight of other cultures, of other political systems, of geographical uh, uh, hot flashpoints, if you will, between countries and understanding how these situations came to be in the present day based on colonial history, map making post World War I, for instance. No, 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 none of that. They're getting it straight from the think tank. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you've probably seen some examples of this, haven't you? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I was just going to say the the hearing with Anthony Blinken for 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 U.S. Secretary of State. Um, I'm not sure if it was Cruz or or Rubio, but what, I mean, like it was verbatim from from a paper that I was just looking at that that week uh, for research for for other things, and he was talking about uh, China wasn't wasn't hasn't been integrated, you know, into the, you know, hasn't been liberalized. And this is a, a mantra that every, every paper that you will read for, for decades, this is all that these papers talk about. So that's where he's, get, that's where he's getting it. Uh, and, and, um, you know, about Nord Stream 2, uh, the pipeline between Germany and Russia, I think that was Cruz. Yes, that was Cruz, Ted Cruz. Um, just, Straight from the Atlantic Council, I mean, they're talking about the United States stopping a pipeline that goes from Russia to Germany. It, do, it doesn't, you know, somehow bypass the U.S. or something. It just goes straight from Russia to Germany. It's the business of Russia and Germany. It doesn't pass through any other country. So how is this America's business? And the way he was talking about it was that it, it will be stopped. And it doesn't matter what Russia thinks or what Germany thinks. It will be stopped. And and. Lincoln what, totally agreed with him, couldn't agree more. And but that, was, that was interesting. Uh, uh, one, one other point I want to make about uh, Blinken and Cruz is that if you look in the comments section, because it was posted on Ted Cruz's YouTube channel, the, this section of the hearing, and if you look in the comments, you know, everyone that follows Cruz is, is right wing and doesn't like Biden, doesn't like Blinken. But when you actually, you know, so they were imagining that there was some sort of adversarial process going on here. But if you actually just from the outside looked in, 
Blinken couldn't have agreed more with Cruz on everything, on absolutely everything. Uh, so it just goes to show you that the, the role of political partisanship, how that all is uh, playing a game to manage public perception, when in fact everyone there, it, everyone there was pretty much on the same page, except except maybe uh, Rand, Rand Paul wasn't. But like you said, he is a minority, and no matter what he says, and they keep him there, I think, uh, to give people the the illusion that that there is a chance of something happening. Hmm. Well, yeah, and also it it, it does it, it it it's interesting the electorate uh, in his home state in Kentucky. I mean, they'll they'll have they'll entertain him, but in the same state, you'll have some absolutely rabid war hawks. So it does show you uh, that there is some uh, di diversity there. I think in the uh, viewpoints and wishes of the of the electorate in many of these states, uh, more more than is reflected uh, in the mainstream media. That's that's for sure. Now, uh, let's talk about one specific, which I think is a really important flashpoint to nail home. Uh, and, and you go into detail about this uh, in, your, in your article up at 21st Century War. And this is the subject of Iran. Okay, and A lot was made about this, uh, certainly after the election, uh, when it looked as though Biden was going to ascend uh, to power. Immediately, people are talking about what is going to happen uh, with Iran. And specifically, what's going to happen with the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal? And you've got a very interesting take on this. I know you've had it for a long time, which predates uh, the election season. But uh, go ahead and explain uh, to us. And I want to also point people to this document here, which you talk about. Uh, this was published, I believe, by the Brookings Institution. Uh, and the title is Which Path to Persia? Options for a New American Strategy Towards uh, Iran, and this was published some years ago by a number of these uh, people here uh, who are nested comfortably uh, in the Brookings Institution, which is really the main uh, neoliberal, and the Democrats will go to the Brookings Institute, and Republicans too, but it is, is definitely a, a favorite hangout uh, for uh, foreign policy mavens on the Democratic side. But explain to us the, what's going to happen or what's not going to happen with the JCPOA and the importance of this document, which path to Persia? Okay, so this this uh, this deal with Iran, uh, this was done under the Obama administration, but this document was actually published in, in 2009. And of course, what you're looking at in the document didn't just pop up in 2009. This was something they were thinking about for quite a while. And... In this document, they basically say, um, and I, I do believe I have the, the quote in, in the article on the website. So uh, they, they talk about offering Iran a, a deal, basically. They even use the word deal. And they said, we're going to offer this deal to Iran. It's going to be such a great deal that only a country that wants nuclear weapons will turn it down. And then they basically say they will sabotage the deal and then use that as a pretext. To, to pursue regime change against Iran, because that is the singular uh, objective of, of the US, of the, the corporate financier interests that run US foreign policy for real. They have been trying to overthrow the government in Iran for decades, and it doesn't matter who's president. And you know, when you get a new president, you get new rhetorical you know, mechanisms that you could use to manipulate public perception, manipulate international audiences, but at the end of the day, it has always been about regime change. And people say, well, Obama, you know, he wanted to make this deal with Iran. But did he really? Because it was also under his administration that the proxy war against Syria started and also the proxy war against Yemen started. And these were both very close allies of Iran and their prerequisites that need to be checked off the list before war with Iran can start. So you can see that even under Obama, the goal was still regime change, violence regime change, and that the, the nuclear deal was just a ploy. It was to make the U.S. look reasonable, to make them look like they wanted peace, and that it's, I, it's Iran who is the one being belligerent. That is the problem. And this was for them to marshal international support for a war against Iran. And so now you have Biden claiming he wants to go back to the deal. But they're going to find one way or another not to. 
And even if they do, they're going to continue everything else around Iran's peripheries to continue pursuing violent regime change against Tehran. So it, it, it really, it's, it's rhetoric, it's window dressing, that their goal is to overthrow the government there. Uh, what I think could be a possibility is that Israel will play spoiler. So Biden will make it look like he wants to go back to the deal, but Israel will do something allegedly unilaterally to sabotage it and to create a conflict that the U.S. has no choice but to join on the side of Israel. And now all of these you know, Arab countries that are now suddenly so friendly with Israel these days. And, uh, you know, like this, this whole thing where they're talking about returning to the deal, it's, it, it, it will not happen. It will not happen. The goal has never been to give Iran uh, a way out of confrontation with the U.S. and a way to to the table of you know whatever the international order is that, that the U.S. is always referring to. That's oh, interesting. Oh, and, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, um, sorry. One one last point to make about this document in in particular, which path to Persia. All throughout this document, they are very explicit about how they use Israel as an agent provocateur in the region, how they are the one country that can do anything it wants and how the U.S. can use that to their advantage. So when the U.S. can't politically do something or militarily justify doing something, they will use Israel. And we've seen this time and time again. Every time they violate Syrian airspace, every time they're doing something in Lebanon or, or to, to Iran directly, People think that it's Israel doing it on their own. No, it is a team effort. It is a team effort with the, with the U.S. with these special interests in the U.S. No, it's 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 important. You brought that up. the The assassination of uh, General uh, Qasem Soleimani in early 2020. This is a, or just over a year ago, and also uh, Mohendas as well, who is the leader of uh, the PMUs in Iraq. Uh, that was a joint. That was a partner effort by the U.S. and Israel. Uh, it's my understanding that Israel provided the intelligence of locations and so forth on the ground, and the United States was able to uh, uh, parlay that into a drone attack. Uh, and so they are very much working uh, together. Uh, depending on which wh which incident it is, it looks like it's a unilateral uh, action, but in fact it's uh, very, very much coordinated. I might add, too, also that uh, in the latter days of the Trump administration, uh, an announcement was made that was not made to great fanfare, which is that uh, Israel would be folded into CENTCOM, U.S. CENTCOM, Central Command, uh, and control of military operations in the Middle East and Central Asia as well. Now, what is that? Is that significant, in your opinion? Uh, you know, what do you read into that? It's, it's difficult to say, you know, what that might lead to right now because it's just an initial step. But, you know, what are your initial thoughts anyway? What are your feelings on, on that development? So before that, Israel was considered part of Europe. Uh, but now, and uh, officially, this is the reason they say they're doing this, is that now Israel is on such good terms with, with all these other countries in the Middle East and nor North Africa. So now it makes more sense to include them in the Middle East. But actually, this is, you know, uh, now that I was looking into it, uh, just just before before the show, actually, uh, when you mentioned it, it does really look like they're they're going with this. They had this um, this project that was very NATO like in in structure that they wanted to do in the Middle East, a united front against Iran, and because they're having such bad luck, even with the the conflict in Yemen, they're having such bad luck. They're they're adding anyone into the mix that they can, no matter how little sense it makes, including. Israel. So could you imagine a, a Middle Eastern version of NATO with Israel and Saudi Arabia and Qatar? It, may, it makes no sense when, when you look at the, the political rhetoric that, that were always being sold by the, by the corporate media. But in, in terms of special interests, running all of these, you know, having influence on all of these countries, uh, you know, they have no options left. This is the last, you know, this is one of the last things they can think of doing. So they're just going to do it. And they, they don't care how, how ridiculous it looks to have, because could, could you imagine Israel and Saudi Arabia and Qatar all fighting Iran side by side? It's, you know, it's hard to believe, but that's 
what they're trying to, that's what I think they're going to try to do. I think we're going to see something like that. We already see Israel and Turkey, even though they pretend that they don't like each other for, for public consumption, they were hand in hand all throughout the, the, the US-led proxy war on Syria. I think we all re- remember seeing that, many examples of that. Mm-hmm. No, for uh, absolutely. That's that's a Turkey is a difficult one to read uh, on the best of days. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but back to back to this document and also your analysis in your article of which path to Persia. Uh, you said about the, uh, the you know the idea that Israel would be able to play the role of spoiler to create a situation whereby uh, even if even if the Biden administration made full detente towards Iran, made all the best intentions, that uh, the Iranians themselves uh, would no longer trust uh, the United States uh, to honor their end of the agreement. And right before this uh, current administration took power, there was an assassination, a high-profile assassination of an Iranian nuclear scientist uh, who was not just any Iranian nuclear scientist. He was really uh, head of the defense research program uh in in the country of iran you know very uh well regarded uh steeped in qualifications uh really uh, at the top of his country's hierarchy in terms of uh intellectuals and in the in the fields of that he was working in he was killed um do you think that was what you know is, is that the thing that you've described in your analysis here of creating a spoiler situation whereby you know, there, there'd be no chance that the Biden administration could patch up the Iran nuclear deal. What, what do you think about that? I, I think absolutely. I think that there was there was that. There have been some other provocations. There have been some strange incidences where there's you know limpet mines turning up on ships. You know, going going through the Strait of Hormuz, and all of this is designed to create maximum instability, suspicion, and distrust amongst everyone in the region. And, and especially between the, the U.S. and Iran. And, and again, it's, it's to create the pretext for Biden not to return to the deal. Because like I said, they, before they wrote the deal, before they signed it, they already fully planned to sabotage it and use that as a pretext for regime change. So why, what has changed uh, you know, at Boeing or Lockheed or BP or Exxon or any of these corporations? What changed? on the board of directors there where now suddenly they genuinely want peace with Iran. They don't. So the assassinations, you know, the, the attacks on Iranian forces in Syria, carrying out counter-terrorist operations, by the way, that the U.S. is attacking forces that are, are actually fighting real terrorists. And it, it was Lindsey Graham asking Antony Blinken if he thought Iran, uh, Iran was the largest state sponsor of terrorism on earth. And they both agreed that absolutely it was. And it's just it's just surreal. And, and to think that in this political atmosphere that Biden really wants peace with Iran is, again, it's just, it's propaganda. It's to make the US look like they're trying to be reasonable. In reality, they have no, no plan for peace. Uh, I think Iran knows this. And they're just going along with it because they want to appear to be as reasonable as possible ahead of inevitable aggression and provocations against it. Yeah, that that point, I mean, the Mike Pompeo tenure as U.S. Secretary of State, I mean, every time he got up to the podium, I just winced uh, in anticipation of what he was about to say. And normally it looked like he was reading off a very staid script every time, and especially to do with Iran. Uh, Iran is the world's number one state sponsor of terror. They're harboring Al Qaeda, and this is—it's almost like retreads uh, from from even the Bush administration. Uh, there, there's no truth in it at all. Similar rhetoric towards um, Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon, and uh, anybody who's been to Lebanon knows very well that Hezbollah is very much an integrated part of the political life, uh, the the parliament. Uh, the Lebanese government, uh, and and really serves as their uh, vanguard uh, in terms of national defense, especially on their southern border, which was previously occupied uh, by by the Israelis for a number of years uh, as well. So there's reasons why uh, Hezbollah exists. It's not just a 
a, a boogeyman uh, that's uh, funded by Tehran and uh, is determined to wreak havoc uh, in the region against the good people who love freedom and democracy. Uh, so obviously that's too deep of nuance uh, for the Washington consensus. Um, but the, the level of incompetence, the, the Blinken comment, is, uh, I mean, so, so many things that he said during Anthony Blinken during his Senate confirmation hearings, he, he is literally going to repeat most, if not uh, quite a lot of the, the script that uh, Mike Pompeo was reading off of. He will certainly be doing that, as will the spokesperson who that Punch and Judy show with the press conferences. is. I think even John Kirby might even be back in the spokesperson's position, at least either at the Pentagon or the uh the state department all they need is maria harf and it's uh it's it's the the old shows laverne and shirley's back on the air again for another uh four, four years but the level of incompetence to to make statements that are factually incorrect uh that are just so so wrong and so far out of bounds of reality that ima imagine if you were a secretary of energy or uh, some other major department or the health the health and uh Human Services Department, and and you get up in front of the country, and you're going to be saying that uh, you know everybody needs to drink uh, turpentine. Uh, we're we're mandating this, and we're we're providing this, and you need to drink a, a pint of that every morning uh, in order to kill COVID nineteen. You know, um, it, if something that's just crazy, it's completely off the wall, a total lie, and you're basing all of your policies. You're positioning all of your assets based on these statements. That level of income would not be tolerated in any other department, although they're pretty close in some departments, I might add. But, it, but it, with, the, with the U.S. State Department, there seems to be this wide berth of tolerance as to what you can say, whether it corresponds to reality or not. Uh, it's just extraordinary. Um, it's almost like we're in a postmodernist um, we're, we're getting into a weird time in history. Maybe we've always had that time in history, but we just were able to extrapolate it and analyze it better today in the 21st century with all of our new communication nodes. Maybe it has always been that crazy uh, in the past, but um, I, I just, the level of incompetence from the spokesperson who's metting this out to the press and the world, and then right back to the Secretary of State, and then through the embassies, through the foreign service and you have all these positions that are completely like they don't correspond to reality how how can you possibly conduct diplomacy globally uh, when you, you you have these statements that are i mean what what are the russians thinking i mean <laughs> they're thinking can we actually sit down with these people i mean they're talking about crazy things they're saying that our you know if i'm a russian ambassador they think my president, Vladimir Putin, installed Donald Trump in the White House in 2016. I mean, it's it's nuts. So, I mean, it's a slight rant on my part there, Brian. I know I'm, I'm pushing the envelope there, but I'll, I'll hand it over to you uh, about this. Do you think there's any chance of normalization? Are we just going to, is it going to get worse before it gets better? Uh, it absolutely will get worse before it gets better. You, you actually made a very perfect point there. The, the disconnect between what we're being told and, and reality is, it, it's, it's not even close. It's, it's, and it gets, it seems like it gets further and further apart because, you know, you and I have been, we, we've been paying attention for, for a couple of years. Wouldn't you agree that it's, it's getting worse and worse now? I would say it's getting, it's getting much worse now. And, you know, like, like saying Iran is the, the largest, state sponsor of terrorism in the world when when they are the reason be, between them and russia they are the reason and and the syrian arab army they're the reason why isis was smashed and it was the u.s and its allies flying in plane loads of weapons and money and training and and brand new toyota pickup trucks handing it over to groups like al-qaeda and even isis uh how how many videos have you seen where ISIS is firing U.S.-made tow missiles. How did they get those? They didn't have tow missiles, so where did they come from? They, they, you know, so 
it, it is surreal when you actually see what's going on and you know what's going on. And in a lot of cases, you will actually even read it in the New York Times. But the way, just the way, they're very, they're very good at manipulating the, the general public because it'll be in their article. It'll just be further down. Uh, and the way they word it, if you're not paying attention and you, you really don't know, you might assume something else. So it's, it's kind of like hidden in plain sight. And that's why I, I tell people, well, some people criticize me for, for citing Western corporate media, but I cite that for a very specific reason because I want to show people that even the people that uh, are representing a policy that I oppose agree with me that this is actually what they're really doing, that, that the CIA is bringing in plane loads of weapons. Now they're claiming that they're giving these weapons to moderate rebels in Syria, for example, who was giving ISIS and al-Nusra billions of dollars more of weapons that allowed them to dominate the battlefield? You know, pe people should ask that question when they're reading that in the New York Times. The New York Times is telling you that those weapons are going to al-Nusra and ISIS. They're telling you that. Well, look, we got a couple of minutes left. I know we've gone over time here, but I mean, this is just a fascinating conversation and I think an important conversation going into the new uh, administration. But just with regards to your article uh, up at 21stCenturyWire.com, Brian, uh, what are some of the things coming on the horizon? We're talking about if there's going to be any changes in foreign policy, heaven forbid, uh, if that is you know, new areas of conflict opening up uh, under the Biden administration, what what that what will that look like likely, in your opinion? I think we're going to see. I think we're going to see the the, the confrontation between the United States and China uh, escalate because the, the U.S. is not going to accept uh, China surpassing them, but that's what's going to happen. Uh, we saw in the confirmation hearing, you know. Uh, Lindsey Graham complaining that China's not listening to them about Hong Kong, how the national security law pretty much has swept the US backed mobs off of the street permanently. But the US is going to try to come up with something to, to, to come back against China. We, we see them doing things like putting all these sanctions on these companies. And it, it really isn't just about you know, the US as a government competing with China as a government. Uh, one of the companies that they recently sanctioned, one of the last things Trump did before he left was put Comac, uh, a commercial uh, aircraft manufacturer in China on a sanctions list. And why did they do that? Because this company is starting to position itself as a competitor, a direct competitor to Boeing and Airbus. These are two of the companies that you will see in all of these think tanks making US foreign policy. So that's why Comac ended up on the sanction list. It wasn't just, you know, a petty political competition. It's, it's, there's a very real reason why they're doing that. Uh, a, a corporation seeks to make more money next year than they did this year, have more power next year than they had this year to eliminate all competition all across the globe and to work its way into every single market conceivable. And to do that requires getting rid of companies like Comac or companies like Huawei. And so that, that's what we're going to see a lot more of. Uh, the Middle East, I just, I can't imagine what the U.S. will do with, with Russia in, in Syria. And I can't imagine what the U.S. will do. Its allies cannot even handle the, the conflicts, you know, the regime change conflict that they're, they're fighting in Yemen. I don't know how they're going to do anything to Iran. I, I think they will just continue chipping away at it, but they're going to continue fading at the same time. And uh, w what I think will eventually happen and what we'll probably see over the next four years and then whoever is in office after that is these interests uh, that we, we talk about, these transnational corporations, they face real competition now. They face the, the possibility of a world where there is a balance of power against their unchecked, unwarranted uh, influence and power around the globe. And, you know, companies like that, they're not they're not in the business because they're passionate about their industry. They're just making money. It's almost like a virus. And what I think will happen is there will be companies in the U.S. that actually have a purpose, who want to do business with other countries rather than build an empire over them. And uh, I, think they will, I think they will start to take over and have more influence. 
and this old order of you know think tanks and and giant multinational corporations that are getting pushed out of everywhere despite sanctions and despite wars i think uh, that's what we're going to see happen yeah that's what i think yeah thanks and uh that's very interesting i mean africa is also uh, a big piece on the horizon i know you mentioned you touched on that slightly uh in your piece and you alluded to to some things there that's that's a whole nother area of uh of, of analysis uh really um very much in, in my opinion connected with yemen as well uh, in terms of uh, the control of the horn of africa and the gulf of aden uh being an important choke point in terms of trade and shipping uh on on the planet vis-a-vis china by the way uh that that's a very important part of china's belt and road uh, uh, network as well in terms of expanding its uh, economic capabilities globally. But we'll just go back here, just a quick review. If you're joining us on the live stream, this was a diagram that that we put up to kind of represent uh, what I think is one of the most important parts of uh, uh, Brian Berletic's uh, piece up at 21st Century Wire was how the Washington consensus is made, how the foreign policy machine works and where the money starts. And it starts with transnational corporations, big finance, international finance, and that makes its way through think tanks into the mainstream media where ideas are laundered and then disseminated out to the public and then echoed back and through uh, elected officials in Washington, foreign policy, the foreign policy blob, the State Department, foggy bottom, becomes U.S. policy. That creates, quote, market stability for the international uh, uh, companies and for big finance, and that allows more money to go into their coffers, and then the cycle just continues around and around. And that tumble dryer, if you will, Brian, has been in operation now for a very long time, uh, decades, in fact. Um, so, you know, I do uh, encourage people to go and check out your article at uh, 21stCenturyWire.com. It's very enlightening. Uh, it's also very detailed and an important piece, I think. Uh, in terms of understanding uh, what's happening in terms of, you know, where people are getting these ideas from, how the Biden foreign policy, the Trump foreign policy, the Obama, the Bush foreign policy, the Clinton foreign policy, how these things are formed, how they come to be in reality. And I think you've done a, a you know, a very good job uh, at, in making that that happen uh, up on your piece uh, at 21stCenturyWire.com. And so, again, I do uh, encourage people to go and check out this piece by Brian, a very important piece. Uh, it's up on our feature section right now. But uh, again, I want to say thank you very much. Do you want to, any last words, uh, Brian? Tell people also where they can find more of your work uh, as well at Land Destroyer. Okay, so I, ha I have my blog, landdestroyer.blogspot.com. Uh, I also am making daily videos on YouTube, uh, Land Destroyer. Just type Land Destroyer, all one word, and it should pop up. And um, uh, thank you very much for having me, Patrick. I, I really appreciate and really enjoy these discussions. Thank you so much. No, it's our it's our pleasure, Brian. It's our pleasure, and hopefully, we'll be speaking to you again soon. Uh, about uh, well, there's no shortage of things to be talking about in the coming months. That's for sure. But again, thank you very much uh, for joining us for this episode six or episode five, sorry, of uh, Twenty One Wire Live. Brian Berletic, Land Destroyer editor, special contributor at 21stCenturyWire.com. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Well, there he goes, ladies and gentlemen. That's Brian Berletic uh, from Land Destroyer. A great discussion. Uh, if you missed any of this live broadcast, of course, this will be up on YouTube. Uh, you'll be able to view it again on our Twitter account uh, up at 21stCenturyWire.com uh, as well. And also, if you join us, uh, hang on. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, we'll be live again. We've got a very special guest, uh, an absolutely fascinating conversation we're going to have on propaganda, how it happens, how it's constructed, what are the theories behind it, how it's working its way through the news cycle today with issues, not just what we talked about today, but also with issues like the pandemic, like COVID-19, uh, et cetera, and the policies surrounding that mainstream media and government working together uh, in one sort of machine. Uh, we're going to be talking about that on Wednesday. I won't say who our guest is, but uh, I am going to say I'm very excited about that conversation. So do stick around uh, and uh, keep in touch with what we're doing at 21stCenturyWire.com. 
And we'll have uh, a few other links, uh, hopefully, in the show page uh, also to Brian's work and how you can contact him or get in touch with him to support uh, what he's doing uh, as well uh, at Land Story. But uh, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That is the program. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this week. Uh, we'll be back. And uh, I also want to say uh, we're broadcasting live on the Alternate Current Radio Network this Sunday, uh, tomorrow for the Sunday Wire. Uh, so do tune in. And you can find us there uh, on ACR at 21stCenturyWire.com. We'll be broadcasting live at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. UK time. So we'll uh, hopefully we'll see you there. And we'll have another great conversation uh, about a lot of different things also with our roving correspondent for culture and sport, Basil Valentine, uh, as well. So we look forward to that. Take care, everybody, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.